Aloha, Ma Cacao. I'm Michael Bruno, Provost at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And welcome to the Better Tomorrow Speaker Series and a very special event tonight. Um, our speaker series is intended to provide an opportunity for the community to learn about and, and engage in discussions about some of the most important issues of our time. We expect that these event, events will enlighten and hopefully inspire action, in particular tonight's event. Over the years, most of our speakers have come from far away, but it turns out <laughs> I'm looking straight at Professor Hickson when I say that in certain disciplines, the world's top experts are right here in your University of Hawaii. Events such as tonight's also serve to bring organizations together. The Hawaii Community Foundation is UH's primary sponsor in this speaker series. Uh, for this particular event, we've also had plenty of help from a variety of UH and external organizations, and I want to acknowledge them now. They include our College of Natural Sciences, our College of Social Sciences, Conservation International, the College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources, the Resources Legacy Fund, Royal Hawaiian Resort, Scholar Strategy Network, the Sierra Club of Hawaii, the Surfrider Foundation, Sustainable Coastlines, UH Alumni Relations, and the Nature Conservancy. It takes a village. Thank you to all of those organizations for their support. The topic of today's talk could not be more timely. Um, if you follow Civil Beat, yesterday there was an article on Civil Beat pointing out that we are presently in the midst of the third widespread coral bleaching event since 2014. Most climate scientists believe that those events will become annual occurrences in the not too distant future. And the University of Hawaii is responding. As most of you already know, we are re widely regarded as one of the top universities in the world in the ocean sciences, and more broadly, the earth and environmental sciences. Last year, we created the Institute for Sustainability and Resilience and we are just now rolling out a new academic program in sustainability that has participation from 10 different colleges and schools across campus. None of this would have been possible without the support of our federal, state, and local partners. Many of them are here in the room tonight. And I now have the pleasure of introducing perhaps the strongest voice of support um, in that regard, Senator Brian Schatz. I know he needs no formal introduction, and he, he ordered me to keep this short, but I'm gonna do it anyway. <laughs> Senator Brian Schatz is Hawaii's senior United States Senator. He serves on four key Senate committees, appropriations, Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs, Commerce, Science, and Transportation, and Indian Affairs. Importantly, and relevant to this evening's talk, Senator Schatz also serves as the chair of the Senate Democratic Special Committee on the Climate Crisis. As discussed in a, in a terrific article in The Atlantic earlier this year in the summer, this committee is aiming to get as much of the groundwork and the outreach and the coordination done now so that when the Senate takes back control of the Senate, they will begin immediately in passing climate change legislation. Last week, Senator Schatz led a delegation of senators to New York to participate in meetings and events related to the United, United Nations Climate Action Summit. 
When it comes to supporting the university's work in education and research, and in particular, our work related to the environment, our senator always shows up. He was a strong advocate for us to host a national estuarine research reserve on Kaneohe Bay, and he has pushed strongly for climate change related research across several agencies, including the Department of Defense, research in which the University of Hawaii will be a major player. On behalf of the students and faculty of the university, mahalo, Brian. Senator Schatz. Good evening, aloha. aloha. So for, for us, for anyone who grew up on an island, this work is personal. In Hawaii, we learn to appreciate the ocean at a young age. It's part of who we are. And as you know, uh, you don't need to um, ask a scientist or ask a surfer. You're all scientists and surfers in your own way. Uh, the ocean is in a fragile state. We're already seeing the dangerous impacts of climate change, but the thing that makes an event like this so inspirational and so special is that we know that we have the knowledge base and the experience base that is both traditional and current, that is both cultural and scientific, and that we can be an example for the world to do something about it. Hawaii leads when it comes to creating healthier oceans and a more sustainable planet, and the University of Hawaii is at the center of this work. Already you're helping Hawaii to meet our local and global obligations on environmental sustainability. You're conducting critical research on the effects of global climate change and how it will impact Hawaii and our various communities. And you're building a framework for addressing it. One that I'm trying to match through the appropriations process to fund ocean-related projects and by supporting federal legislation to protect scientists from political tampering, to enable disaster funding for the massive coral bleaching events that we have suffered, and to fund local management of our coasts like at the Heia nurse site. You can count on me to continue to work in this partnership with the scientific community and with UH. And I want to thank the UH leaders, professors, and students for your dedication uh, to these efforts. Now, to tell you more about preserving our oceans, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Mark Hickson, UH Professor of Marine Biology. He is a Fulbright Senior Scholar and an Aldo Leopold Fellow, and serves on the editorial boards of four scientific journals. With well over 100 scientific publications, he was named the most cited author on coral reef ecology in America in 2004. Prior to joining the University of Hawaii, he was the chair of the Marine Protected Areas Federal Advisory Committee for NOAA and of the Ocean Science Advisory Committee for the National Science Foundation. Dr. Hickson, we thank you for your steadfast commitment to protecting our oceans and protecting our planet. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mark Hickson. Aloha. Wow. <laughs> Mahalo, Senator Schatz, for those kind words. Um, thank you, Dr. Bruno, for your support for this speaking series. So, such an opportunity to be here. Mahalo, Dr. Gone, Sam, for that inspiring Oli. And mahalo to all of you for being here. The size of this crowd tells me how important the oceans are for all of us, our ocean. I love our ocean. I was lucky to be born by the ocean and live on many shores around the world during my childhood. And I've had a career where I've been able to study sea life underwater using scuba and small submarines in many places around the world. And it's just been such a fantastic experience and I typically when I've given talks in the past it's all been about talking story about just all the cool creatures that live in the sea so let me just start with a couple examples of, of my, my favorite fish or a couple of my favorite fish these are on opposite sides of the Pacific from us 
So this little guy that looks like a lump of sponge or coral is a, is a frogfish. We have frogfishes in Hawaii. They're only about four inches long or so. This one's from the Philippines, and it's a little different. You see that little thing out in front of it? That's actually part of the fish that it uses to fish for fish. So it sits there quietly, not moving, looking like a piece of the reef. Something comes in, it wiggles this thing in front of it. Something comes up, and it reaches up and grabs it. But check out the lure on this guy. It's in the shape of a little fish. It has eyes, it has fins, it has everything else. So on this planet, living with us, is a fish that fishes for other fish using a fishing lure that's a fish. <laughs> Unreal. Even weirder is this guy on the opposite side of the Pacific. This was uh, filmed in Monterey Bay in deep water. This is hundreds, thousands of feet deep. This is not a computer-generated image. This is an actual fish. What you're seeing is a fish that has a perfectly transparent head. And those green blobs you see are its eyes. And what this transparent head allows this fish to do is swim horizontally in the water column with its eyes looking straight up. Why in the world would it develop that adaptation? Well, it turns out this thing steals prey from jellyfish. So living in the deep water, the only source of light is filtering down from above. So it just swims along, scanning upward, till it can finally resolve a jellyfish with those green tinted eyes, then swim up to it. The eyeballs then roll forward um, to where you can see those two viewing ports in front, like a, a mask, and then steal the prey from the jellyfish and continue doing its thing. Science is way weirder than science fiction. <laughs> so I could go on all night showing you things like this, and it would be delightful. But unfortunately, things have changed in recent years. And they've especially changed for me when I see kids, the keiki, um, especially now that I'm a grandfather. Whenever I see children, I feel sad, and I feel afraid for them. And I hate feeling that way. So what I want to do tonight is, after briefly reviewing all the wonderful gifts that the ocean gives us, take you on a little stroll through hell of all the threats that our oceans are facing, but then come back up with hope and hopefully action for the future. Because all these problems, every single one of them, is solvable. The scientific community has made that very, very clear. We can get out of these things. So if you find yourself feeling depressed, hold on to the end. So here we are in the most isolated archipelago of islands on the Earth, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, incredibly beautiful. I would talk more broadly about the oceans, but I really want to focus on our ocean, the ocean immediately adjacent to our islands. That is state waters where we have jurisdiction. If, I don't know if you can see that map in the rear of the room, but there's a little thin red line around each of the islands. That's three nautical miles offshore. That's the jurisdiction of the state before you get into federal waters. That's where most of us interact with the ocean, and it's also where we have some control of what happens. This is our ocean. So let's start with the amazing bounty that our ocean provides for us. If you've spent any time underwater in Hawaii, undoubtedly you've been struck by the beauty, the awe, the connection, and the spirit of our ocean. We are blessed here with having about 25% of our species, a quarter of our marine species, are found nowhere else in the world, only here. And all, all the news is bad. That honu you saw, that sea turtle. Sea turtles have been coming back. I lived here 40 years ago and never saw a sea turtle diving. I see them on every dive now. But no matter how far away I look or how closely I look at the reef, I'm always just absolutely amazed. We are just so lucky to have that connection with nature. More practically, the, food, the oceans feed us. 
the ancient Hawaiians got most of their animal protein from the ocean, and fishing, of course, is still very popular on the Hawaiian islands. Worldwide, about 20% of the world fish catch comes from coral reefs, which occupy only about 1% of the surface of the ocean. They're just protein factories, just amazing protein factories. Surfers all realize that the ocean also protects our coast by growing coral reefs. These are underwater shots of wave breaking on coral reefs. Without those reefs out there, that wave energy would come all the way to shore and rapidly erode our, erode our coastlines. So we're very lucky that the reefs are there as natural breakwaters. And of course, when the reef's shaped right and the waves are good, they also provide amazing recreational opportunities, especially here in Hawaii, some of the best surf in the world. Of course, the big thing is tourism. Tourism brings about $1.2 billion to Hawaii every year, and most of the people are here to be by the ocean, to be in a clean ocean, full of life, and just a wonderful experience. So besides all the spiritual reasons to be connected with the ocean, there are obviously very important economic reasons. What many people don't realize is the ocean is also a new source of medicines, medicines that treat horribly debilitating diseases, cancers, leukemia, and other terrible diseases. These three compounds, among many others, were found in very humble coral reef organisms, sponges, sea squirts, things like that. Pharmaceutical companies are, are going through these species and screening them for medicinal um, properties, and it's just a gold mine, an absolute gold mine. Once the, once the chemical's identified, it can be synthesized artificially, so they don't have to go kill everything. But the problem is that we're losing species faster than they can be screened for medicine. And who hasn't been touched by cancer, directly or indirectly? It could be that the cure is out there, and either we've already lost it or we just haven't discovered it yet. So the ocean is just a cornucopia of free services and free goods that nature asks nothing in return. It's all there for us. So now the dark stuff. Unfortunately, we've not been the world's best stewards, either on land or in the sea, especially in the sea. And probably the main reasons for the oceans being so poorly treated is most people don't look under the surface. They don't see what happens. And there's always been this psychological thing that, well, the oceans are so big, we can throw our nuclear waste in the ocean, we can dump our trash in there, the ocean will absorb it. Well, the oceans are getting filled. There's now 7.7 .7 billion of us. By mid-century, there'll be 9.7 billion. And the projections are that by the end of the century, there'll be 11 billion people on this planet. We're running out of space rapidly. So the old days are gone. There's just too many of us. And if you think about that many people occupying a planet that has this much water, you can see where the issues lie. That little blue dot you see is all the water in the world coalesced into a single drop. It's a drop 800 miles in diameter. The world has a very thin layer of water on it, even though it is the ocean planet, 71% covered. So when you think about that ratio, of course we're affecting the oceans. And if we don't do so mindfully, then we're going to get in trouble, which we've been starting to do. In Hawaii, it started with poor land use practices back before people were thinking much about the fact that the ocean is downstream from everything. So sediment from poor agricultural practices and, culture and um, coastal development has swamped our reefs and basically buried the corals, smothering them, as you can see in this photograph. Fertilizers and sewage, either from poor agricultural practices or poor treatment of sewage, um, seeps into the ocean and fertilizes seaweeds, which then overgrow the corals. And of course, all the pollution that can flow 
flows into the ocean, stressing and killing sea life. Not only chemicals like sunscreens that we've heard about, oil and what have you, but also things like sound. Sound from boats affects the behavior of fish. Lights shining on the ocean at night affects the movements of marine mammals and sea turtles. And of course, there's the plastic. Plastic everywhere. This is becoming the problem of our times next to climate change. Annually, about 10 million tons of plastic end up in the ocean. And if it went away, that'd be one thing, but the, ocean, the plastic never goes away. Plastic does not break down and disappear. It simply goes into smaller and smaller and smaller bits through time as it reacts with sunlight. And it eventually gets so small that sea life eats it. So this is a Laysan albatross chick from the Northwest Islands. And all those plastic bits you see on the right-hand side were in the stomach of this chick, fed by its parents who thought they were food items. And the chick starved to death, being full of plastic. Many people say, well, the plastic's all coming from elsewhere. It's all coming from Asia or what have you. But all you have to do is walk down to Alawai Harbor to realize that that's a fallacy. This is our own plastic debris, and it's, it's everywhere. Now, as this demonstration at one of our beaches will show, the, the extreme danger about plastic is that it gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it becomes what's called microplastics, little tiny bits. And those little tiny bits of plastic have two problems. One, they're eaten by sea life, ever smaller sea life as the plastic gets smaller, but also they accumulate toxins and pollutants. They're actually sort of chemical magnets. So they've become little poison pellets. And these things are now found everywhere. And by everywhere, I mean inside all our bodies, in our feces, in our seafood. It's everywhere. Even the clothes we wear are pollutants, polyester clothing. Those little fibers that come off our clothes that we vacuum up, they all end up in the ocean and they all end up in our sea life. So one thing we can do is start wearing cotton and bamboo. Oh, I hate going down this list, sorry, but bear with me. Overfishing. So what you see in this graph, I'm going to try to show a few graphs, but this one's very effective. This is work by my um, former UH colleague, Alan Friedlander, in his lab. Um, each one of these bars represents the abundance of fish in different locations in Hawaii. On the far left, the purple bar is Papahanao Mokuakea, which is sort of a baseline. No fishing occurs up there. That's how much fish could be on our reefs. And everything else are the main Hawaiian islands. And you can see there's a big drop as soon as you get to the main islands. The little dashed line you see going across there is what fisheries biologists often consider to be an overfish threshold. That is 20% of that original virgin biomass fished down, 80% of the fish loss. Anything below that has difficulty recovering. And you'll notice that most of the main islands are below that threshold especially our island. Those little orange blobs you see on the far right are all the samples from Oahu. Now, yes, there are fishermen who know where to find fish still. There are still some pockets of fish abundant. But all, by and large, this was a fairly exhaustive sampling showing us that we have severely, severely overfished our reefs. Invasive species. Invasive species are species from elsewhere in the world, non-native to Hawaii, brought here by human activities, often in the ballast water of ships where um, the larvae get into our harbors. Honolulu Harbor is full of, of foreign species. But they also arrive attached to floating plastics and other things and pop up in strange places. Last um, month, there was a cruise to Papahanao Mokuakea by um, um, Randy Kosaki, who's here tonight, and other members of NOAA. And they found that Pearl and Hermes Atoll Reef is now covered 
with an unknown alga. They're still trying to figure out what species this is. They've gotten it down to the genus. Certainly not native to Hawaii. And underneath that seaweed, dead coral. Well, as if all that wasn't bad enough, let's look at the horrible twins of ocean warming and ocean acidification. And let's spend a moment to think about how we got here. This balloon you see, the pink blue, is all the air in the atmosphere in one sphere. Again, a very thin layer. The atmosphere is only about 10, 10 uh, miles thick. So what do we do to this atmosphere? Every year, we've added about nine petagrams of carbon. A petagram is a billion metric tons. Um, and more recently, we're up to about 9.8 petagrams. This is, these data are about 10 years old. It's impossible to imagine how much carbon that is, so I've tried to put it in tangible um, scale here. If you imagine the Empire State Building and take over 26,000 of them and lay them end to end, they'd extend from Scandinavia to Cape Town over 6,000 miles. Same as the distance from California to Japan crossing over the Pacific Ocean. That's solid carbon, solid carbon. Now imagine taking all that carbon and atomizing it into carbon dioxide, a gas. That's how much CO2 we're putting into the atmosphere every single year from burning fossil fuels, from burning our forests and other activities. It's what runs our society. But there's too much. Where does it all go? Well, about a quarter to the th of a third of that CO2 is directly absorbed by the oceans, just dissolved in seawater, where it reacts with water and forms a weak acid called carbonic acid, which causes problems for sea life I'll get to later. Another quarter to a third is taken up by growing plants, especially trees. Thank goodness for trees. Thank goodness for reforestation efforts. A recent study has shown that if we just plant trees like crazy, it can solve a big part of our global warming problem. The rest of the CO2 goes in the atmosphere where it enhances the greenhouse effect, resulting in a warming atmosphere that warms the oceans. About 90% of that excess heat has been absorbed by the oceans so far, rather than releasing it directly into the atmosphere. The carbonic acid makes carbon, or calcium carbonate or limestone less available for sea life such as corals and shellfish and even the inner ear stones of fish. So these are the, these are the evil twins, ocean warming and ocean acidification. So let's briefly take this stroll through hell. So the ocean is warming here in Hawaii like everywhere else. These are data from NOAA for Hawaii. And you can see the amount of warming that's taken place so far. That's a little squiggly line with the trend line through it. And the projected increase in temperature into the future, depending upon whether we add more and more and more carbon or if we add less and finally level off. This is the efforts that are being made now by Senator Schatz and his colleagues to try to head this off before we go over the top. Now that warming has various consequences. This is research by Chip Fletcher at UH. If you see the little scale down on the left, it's sea level rising all the way up to four feet overlooking Waikiki where we are. And the colors are blue being sea level and then all the other colors are areas that where there's um, salt water seepage into the um, the basements of buildings and, and otherwise um, different parts of, of land. This is definitely going to happen. We can't stop this. We're committed. And all the estimates that have made made so far about sea level rise have been too conservative. Sea level rise is happening faster than the scientists have predicted. The reason that sea level is rising is twofold. One is as the oceans warm, water expands and that increases the volume of the oceans. And then 
glaciers on land are melting and all that excess water is flowing into the oceans. You've probably seen news reports of what's happening in Greenland and the West Antarctic Peninsula. So this is not going to be pretty when this happens. It's not going to be like Waikiki becomes the um, Venice of the Pacific Ocean. This is going to be a mess. The, the waters are going to be polluted. Um, buildings are going to be in and uninhabitable. And it's going to happen sometime this century. And we keep building skyscrapers right next to the beach. I don't get that one. Storms are worsening. In, in particular, hurricanes are intensifying because hurricanes feed off warm water. We were lucky this year in that we didn't have many storms in the Pacific. The Atlantic got them all this year. In fact, things tend to oscillate back and forth between the Atlantic and the Pacific. But last year was a dangerous year, if you recall. Hurricane Wallaka, which missed the inhabited islands, hit French frigate shoals in the Northwest Islands and completely wiped out the most beautiful coral reef in Hawaii called Rapture Reef. You can see what it used to look like in the upper right. The lower right hand photo is the exact same location that Randy Kosaki and his colleagues documented just last month. They were astonished. The reef was literally erased off the atoll. At the same time, there was a sand island there that used to be a nesting site for sea turtles. That sand island is now gone. Very horrific storm, category five. The photo you see here is Hurricane Lane. Remember Hurricane Lane? It was barreling toward us. This is its path. It was heading straight for Oahu. Everybody was getting ready. The state did a good job. The city did a good job of preparing. And then fortunately, wind shear just took it away. Almost a miracle. We're not going to be as lucky in subsequent years. We need to prepare for these storms and what they will do to our coastlines. Well, this is the one that touches home for me the most, coral bleaching. So the coral polyp right here, my little hand, was the first creature mentioned in the Kumulipu, the Hawaiian creation chant. It's the founding organism of our islands. And these little polyps, little tiny things, little sea anemone-like things, have little single-celled microbe, plant-like organisms that live inside their tissues. And they live in a mutualism, a symbiosis, that allows the coral to grow, to secrete its calcium carbonate skeleton, grow upward, and create our reefs. It's a wonderful gift, corals. But when the water becomes too warm, that mutualism breaks down, the polyps spit out their microbes, become transparent, and the coral appears white. That's what we call coral bleaching. It's not really bleaching. It's just loss of color. If the bleaching is severe, the coral will die, and the skeleton then erodes. Now, this is a laboratory shot by colleagues in Australia showing coral bleaching in action sped up. It normally takes place over a couple days. Watch this in action. What you see at the end here is d the dead coral skeleton starting to be colonized by seaweeds. And eventually, there'll be organisms that drill into it, and waves will come and break it down, and the reef will collapse. This is starting to happen worldwide. So what we can anticipate is some of our nice, healthy reefs one day turning white as snow, like this reef did in the Great Barrier Reef, dying and eventually collapsing into rubble, and all those wonderful goods and services gone forever. This strikes home because I've seen this happen before. Before coming back to UH, I worked a lot of time in the Caribbean. And during the great first bleaching event of 1997, 1998, I watched my favorite coral reef die before my very eyes in a very isolated part of the Bahamas. 
and it was absolutely heartbreaking. You can imagine what it's like to try to scuba dive with tears filling your mask. Um, it really affected me to the point where I, I turned my career strictly toward conservation. And we have only talked about one twin so far, ocean warming. The other twin is ocean acidification. So all that carbon dioxide forming carbonic acid in the ocean inhibits the ability of sea life to bring in calcium carbonate and build their skeletons. So this is a map of the world in 1950. The dark red areas are areas where calcium carbonate is not really available very much. And that's at the poles. At the poles, naturally, the water is very cold, which inhibits calcification, as well as the ocean tends to be relatively um, high in CO2. The green areas are most of the world, including where all the coral reefs live. And let's watch what happens through time, projecting into the future up to 2011. So here's the years ticking off. Maybe you can find your birthday in here. And what I want you to notice is how things accelerate through time. Here we are now. And that red just gets darker and darker and darker and darker. So our reefs are caught, and it's not going to stop at 2100. Everybody makes projections to 2100. Our kids, kids, kids are going to be living in the next century. And then to add insult to injury is the fact that most of these problems are accelerating and getting worse through time. So what you're seeing here in the graph is time, where we are now in terms of how bad things are getting. It's going to get worse much faster through time. This is the most important thing I'm telling you tonight, that we don't have a whole bunch of time left to turn these things around. We ain't seen nothing yet. So I hate presenting this stuff. I hate it. Take a moment and think about what you're feeling right now about these things. Are you feeling sad? Are you feeling afraid? Are you angry? If you're having these feelings, that's a warning, a warning that things are not right, that things must change, or it's only going to get worse. But they can change. That's the good news. It's not yet too late. But we don't have a whole bunch of time more to kick the can down the road like we have been. So in addition to my scientist hat, I'm going to now put on my fellow citizen hat, because I did not abdicate my citizenship when I became a scientist. Some scientists abhor expressing their opinions. I'm going to do it. Because for decades, the scientific community has been giving scientific information to society and then standing back. Has anything changed? Nope. So now we're diving in. So here I go. And nothing I'm going to say is new. I'm just reemphasizing ideas that many people have had. First, it all begins inside us. It all begins here. If it doesn't start here, it's never going to start. It has to start with our sense of connection with nature, which is natural for children if they're not kept indoors all the time, and typically has to be forced on adults. Once we have that sense of connection, we know that we are part of a larger biosphere, a larger entity, and that all our actions have consequences, be they positive or negative. Now, this idea of connection, which is so central to Hawaiian culture, is something that just has to be grasped before we can move forward. I want to give you one small example of how deep these connections are. And this is a little tiny side example. The fish you see there on the left is a parrotfish, uhu. Parrotfish with their little funny fused beaks feed by scraping dead coral surfaces, surfaces where the corals are dead most of the time, removing seaweed from those surfaces. This allows corals to settle and grow, after, especially after the settlement of this stuff called crustose coralline algae. So that grazing, that lawnmower of the sea action, results in less seaweed and more coral. But it doesn't stop there. When the uhu poop, 
they poop sand. And they poop a lot of sand. They poop so much sand that much of the sand we walk on on our beaches is parrotfish poop. <laughs> so parrotfish are our friends. They help us have more coral. They help us have less erosion. Well, I'm sorry to report that these fish are severely overfished. I was just appalled when I came back to Hawaii after 40 years and saw how few parrotfish are available. We're actually doing a study now where we're trying to encourage parrotfish and we're just not even getting little babies coming in. There's not enough spawners out there. So because of overfishing of parrotfish, there's more seaweed, less coral, less sand, and more erosion. Everything is connected. This is just one small example. What must we do to rectify this? We have to save the uhu, pure and simple. But we're not yet. There's not enough funding for enforcement. There's not enough education about the importance of these fish. And what we see are things like this. This is a group of guys who went out at night on scuba gear. So these are not poor people, OK? These are people with scuba gear going out at night with spear guns and killing the uhu as they sleep in holes in the reef and wipe it out an entire reef. They actually have a name for it, bombing the reef. We bombed that reef. Most of the fish you see in this photograph are from a single reef, and they basically wiped out the uhu on that reef. This has got to stop if we want to save our reefs. So a beautiful vision shared by many people, probably everyone in this room. People often say, Hawaii is so small. Hawaii doesn't make any difference in the world. We don't make any difference in presidential elections. The amount of carbon we put in the atmosphere is small compared to the rest of the world. Why should we, why should we care that much? We're so small. That idea is ludicrous. Over 10 million people visit us every year. We have the opportunity to be a showcase for the world. And there are many people working on this right now. Just by people coming here and visiting and seeing a wonderfully sustainable green society, they will take that message home and that will help the world change. And I would just love to see Hawaii beat all the other states, beat California, beat any place else in the world in sustainability. And it only takes two things. Courageous leaders who are willing to set short-term interests aside for future generations, and an engaged citizenry that's educated about the issues and takes action. With those two things, nothing can stop us. And all those are already in place in our state. We just need to move a little more. Just move a little more. Take steps. And these steps are happening, and I'm so happy to see this. Mayor Caldwell's Office of Climate Change, Sustainability, and Resiliency is doing a whole variety of very good initiatives um, at the city and county level. Governor Ige has a Sustainable Hawaii Initiative, which has five pillars of action. If you can't read them in the back, going from the left, there's doubling local food production, very important. Let's include fish ponds there. Ancient Hawaiian fish ponds were incredibly productive of fish. Let's bring them back and use them again. There's um, biosecurity for invasive species. There's watershed protection, which also involves reforestation. So important. Pull the carbon out of the air, shade the ground, and cool it. There's a 30 by 30 marine management initiative for 30% of nearshore marine waters to be effectively managed by 2030. And finally, there's the complete 100% transfer to renewable energy by 2045. A good start. And there's more that could be done. First off, only the 100% renewable energy is a law. The rest of it is the governor's initiative. With a new governor, it could all go away. What are we doing about plastics? There are bills every single year having to do with plastics, and they almost always fail because of short-term business interests. 
bamboo makes wonderful temporary um, eating utensils, paper cups, things of that sort. Bill 40 is before the city council right now to help stop all that. And I've always been a little concerned and wondering about why only 30%? Why only 30% of our priority watersheds? I don't even know how many priority watersheds there are. But why don't we protect all of them on an accelerated schedule? And why only 30% of our marine waters? Are we gonna let the other 70% be the way they've always been? And must we take a full generation to reach 100% renewable energy? When World War II started, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, we won that war in four years. During the space race, we got, went to the moon and back in less than 10 years. We could move faster. And the reason I'm pushing that is that, as I'll show you at the very end of my talk, we must move faster. But right now, I want to spend a little bit of time focusing on research at the University of Hawaii that benefits this brain management initiative. And it focuses on the importance and use of what are called marine reserves. Marine reserves are part of the ocean set aside and protected, protected from human activities of any deleterious kind. And people are often very upset about marine reserves because they say, all you're doing is stopping fishing here and I don't get to fish in my favorite place anymore and it's gonna concentrate fishing elsewhere. Well, that's not true. It turns out that closed areas actually benefit fished areas outside their borders. Now for a long time this was just a hypothesis, but I'm gonna show you data from UH that shows that this is actually true. So what you see in the diagram are two effects. One's called the seeding effect. That's where fish settle and grow inside marine reserves, get big and fat, produce lots of eggs, spawn, and their eggs and larvae drift out, and eventually the baby fish settle outside the reserve. The seeding effect, just like seeds. The spillover effect occurs when population sizes get large inside the reserve, and then they get crowded and move outside the boundaries. Fishermen often target the edge of marine reserves for that reason. It's called fishing the line perfectly legitimate way to fish. The nice thing is you have money in the bank and you're living off the interest rather than exploiting all the capital. So a long time people thought seeding effect, that doesn't make any sense, it doesn't really happen. Well, research here has shown it does happen. Uh, these are two maps of the Big Island. If you look first at the map on the left, it shows larval dispersal by reef fishes up the Kohala Kona coast um, some of it from marine reserves, shown there in the red triangles, as well as an area that's not severely fished, Punalu'u down at the south. So this is all done by genetics. You take little fin clips from adult fish and from baby fish, and you can do parentage analyses. It's really remarkable. So each one of these arrows represents a parent and an offspring. So it shows where the parents spawned that baby fish and where that baby fish ended up settling and growing. And as you can see, larvae tend to move northward up this coast. So that's valuable for understanding how marine reserves work. But you can also tie that in with the figure on the right, which was done by Jack Kittner, Kittinger and his colleagues at Conservation International that showed the distribution of fish catch or the spreading of fish catch across the island. And what all these arrows show us is that everything is connected. The main lesson of the oceans. So the people who are eating fish in North Kohala on the Big Island are eating fish that were originally spawned on the south end of the Big Island. So those communities should probably get together and make sure their fishery is managed properly. At a larger scale, genetic work done by the, the most active genetics lab um, in Hawaii, Rob Tonin and Brian Bowen's lab at the University of Hawaii, has shown major gaps in larval dispersal. So what you see on the, the map there are these blue blobs. The blue blobs represent barriers to dispersal. Because of ocean currents and the way things move in the ocean, not a lot of larvae cross those blue barriers. 
And what this shows us is not only are we separated from Papahanao Mokuakea, but our islands tend to be separated from each other. Kauai is separated from Oahu. Maui Nui is separated from the big island. That means each island's pretty much on its own. We can't count on Oahu's overfishing problem being solved by other islands. And it's even more complex than that. This is, these are brand new data from the University of Hawaii. Richard Coleman, a graduate student of Brian Bowen, who as part of a, a larger study that a group of us have, uh, generously funded by the Castle Foundation, shows larval dispersi, dispersal of manini, a very important food fish in our waters. Fish were sampled all the way around the island, both adults and juveniles, and what you can see is all the connectivity is occurring on the windward side of the island. Especially Kaneohe Bay is receiving larvae, not only from the north, that big thick arrow from Laia, but also from the south, from Kailua. So these are data that are brand new, people hadn't even thought about before. But it tells us very clearly, we must manage the fisheries on Oahu shore by shore. We must manage the island separately. The tools are there. They're ready to be used to help bring about a sustainable ocean. So to wrap up, we have choices to make. We can either continue what we've been doing. Everybody can drive a gas guzzler or use plastic like crazy or whatever else we do, have AC on all the time without solar panels, and things will just continue down the Rhine and accelerate. Poor land use practices will smother our reefs and pollute the oceans. Plastic debris will be all over the inside of us and our children, along with the pollutants they attract. Overfishing will remain rampant. No woohoo. Invasive species will continue to spread and cause problems. Sea level rise will worsen, will be nailed by big hurricanes. Coral bleaching and death and ocean acidification will have severe effects on our reefs. That's not the future I want for my grandkids. I like the idea of Hawaii as a showcase for the world, where we clean up our watersheds, reforest them, Get rid of single-use plastics. I can't stand styrofoam. I walk my, my local beach every day and clean up the plastic, and there's little bits of styrofoam everywhere. You get, a, you get plate lunch, you eat the plate lunch, you toss the styrofoam. It doesn't stay in the bin. It blows out because it's light, ends up in the ocean. Marine reserves, best way to bring our fisheries back and make sure we have resilient systems. Biosecurity stopping invasive species before they get started. Renewable energy, God, I would just love to see more solar panels on every building in Hawaii and more use of electric cars. Has anybody test drove the new Nissan LEAF? It drives just like a regular car and it's not expensive. And it has a range, even with a small battery, the range is over 150 miles. Where are you gonna go on this island? Reforestation, there are many different groups that are planting trees and God bless them. And of course, local agriculture, 90% of our food is brought in from the outside. We can grow our own food. All that fallow farmland can be used and aquaculture, our fish ponds. But I wanna emphasize one more time that we need to move more rapidly. This is a graphic of ocean temperature across the whole archipelago this summer. You can see the dates ticking off in the upper right-hand corner. The darker the red colors, the more severe the predicted coral bleaching. This ends on September 29th. I had to turn in my slides early. But I think we got lucky this year, believe it or not. The Northwest Islands are definitely bleaching. That dark red means alert level two, which is very severe bleaching in the works. But look at the halo around Kauai and Oahu. We might just get away with it this year. There's been some bleaching occur, fairly bad bleaching at Lanikai, and some bleaching elsewhere, but not really massive bleaching yet, at least on these islands. You can see that Maui Nui and the south end of the Kona coast 
is, is getting hit pretty hard. But this is about to end. Within about a week, all that heat's gonna dissipate. These rains have helped it. So we might just squeak by this year. But look at the shortly coming future. This is a modeling exercise predicting the decline of reefs due to coral bleaching, starting at the present, going into the future. All the green lines are different runs of the model at one meter depth, very shallow coral reefs that get even warmer. And um, the predictions are that by the middle of the century, the reefs will be dead. This is just a model though. Maybe, maybe we'll get away with it. The deeper reefs, 20 meter depth, the blue lines there show that the reefs will persist longer toward the end of the century. I hope this doesn't happen. We have many coral researchers now who are identifying corals that can withstand bleaching and bounce back or not even bleach. So maybe we can help propagate them. Maybe we can bring back the yuhu to make sure that there's places for the corals to grow. But we need to move more rapidly than we have been moving. I know the political process is slow, but we have leaders who are inspired and we, all we need is the people to demand it and I, I believe it'll happen. One last prediction, prediction is that by 2040, corals will bleach every single year. I hope that's not true. So the bottom line, and the ancient Hawaiians knew it, if we care for the ocean, the ocean will care for us. I hope you will take this information, not be depressed, but be inspired for action. Because if we all take steps, Hawaii can show the world the way. And I just would so much love to see that for the sake of my grandkids. Mahalo. <laughs>